Hello and welcome to a short-ish tutorial style video that I am titling My Top 10 Tips to Go From Bedroom to Band. January 2019, a friend of mine phones me up, who's a drummer, and says, I'm starting a band, do you want to be in it? Of course, I said yes, I haven't been in a band since I was in my early 20s, and I was thinking about it for 2019 as my next challenge. So, we started the band together, got a keyboard player, chose a few songs, got in a studio, and just played and had fun. Fast forward to now, August 2019, eight months later, and we have a bass player, we have a few songs that we really enjoy playing, and we also have the challenge of playing a open mic night in September, uh, the drummer's birthday party in October or November, and a few other things that have cropped up over the last few months where people have heard what we're doing and are interested in us maybe playing for them. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting just to pull together some things that I've learned over that time as a part one video, and then maybe a part two video once I've played live a few times and can maybe update some of these tips. First of all, here's a very quick clip of us doing something in the studio, just so you can see I'm not just making this up. Okay, starting with, as is custom, tip number one. Tip number one is know your songs. This is especially important if you are hiring practice space like we do, where you're paying, say, £40 for three or four hours of practice time. If you turn up and don't know your songs, what you're doing is you're using that time to learn the songs. And it's an expensive way to do it. You should be learning the songs at home. You should also all be learning the same versions of the songs. So we have a shared drive where we have all of the sheet music, the tab, the drum patterns, whatever else it might be, and links to YouTube videos of the version of the song that we are going to practice. Um, doesn't mean you won't come across small problems. I had a great example the other day with the bass player where the tab that he downloaded a ultimate guitar, I think, um, for some bizarre reason, had an extra bar of one of the notes in it, which wasn't actually in the real song. So there's still gonna be some moments where you have the crossover, but it makes it a lot easier if you all know your parts before you get in the studio, because then you can enjoy just getting those bits right. This leads us into tip number two. And tip number two is to have an agreed plan of attack for the session. So agree the songs you're gonna do, uh, and then what order you're going to do them in, how long you're going to spend on them, ideally, um, and then do it. Go in, play the song, break it down. If there are bits that are wrong, break it down, work out why it's wrong, fix it, play it. And play it until it's as good as you think you can get it in that session and move on to the next song, and the next, and the next, and the next. Um, it just helps to be a bit more focused. It's great fun going and just messing around, but if you're paying for that time, it's better to make good use of that time. Number three, ear protection. Now, I cannot emphasize enough how important ear protection is for musicians. They are the most, well, fundamental part of you being able to play, is being able to hear what you're playing. And the number of people I see on YouTube and in studios and in bands who aren't wearing ear protection is incredible. Now, I use, I'll put a link to them and a picture up on the screen, uh, I think they're called Alpines, and they're specifically made for sort of making music quieter. And there's little earplugs you put in, you have three um, stoppers on them for different volumes, and 
what they do is they just make things quieter. They don't cut out frequencies particularly. And you get expensive ones and cheap ones. What you mustn't use are ear defenders or um, those cheap little rubber bungs that you stick in because they just make everything sound dull and you can't hear anything properly. You need proper ones that are designed for concerts or musicians uh, so that they let through all of the key frequencies to allow you to hear what you're doing. Which kind of leads into number four. Now number four is turn it down. The tendency when you're in a band um, situation is for everyone to keep turning things up. And the reason is drums, live drums are really, really loud. So you're constantly fighting against them. Like fighting against them, it feels like you are. So your bass player will turn up a little bit. You can't hear yourself anymore, so you turn up a little bit. Keyboard player turns up with the guitar. So by the end of it, I've been in, a, in the situation where everyone's on maximum and no one can hear anything. They can't hear themselves and it's just getting louder and louder and louder. And it's chaos and it's horrible and it's frustrating. Now there are ways around that, which leads us to tip number five, which is speaker position. So to be able to play at the lowest practical volume with the live drummer, you need to make sure the speakers are positioned in a way that makes sense. So generally when you're in a studio, what often happens, especially when you go into one that's been laid out for you, you've got your amps against the walls, drums at the back, and probably a mixing desk and a couple of PA speakers. Um, so you go and stand next to your amp, plug in and hit a chord and you don't hear much. So you turn it up, hit a chord, you don't hear much. And the drums are really loud. You might be able to hear the PA speakers if you're near the front of the room. But the drummer can't hear the vocals, they can't hear the keyboards if they're in the PA or the bass or whatever. Now, the reason for this is the way sound travels out of a speaker. If you think about the way most speakers were, they have a cone, the sound comes out in a, sort of in a conical fashion. So if your sound is coming out here and you're stood next to your amp, you're not in the path of the sound. Also, your amp, unless you've got a stack, is knee high. So if you even if you stand in front of it, all you're doing is playing to the back of your legs and your ankles, and neither of them have ears. So first things first, if you can lay the room out as if you're going to play as a band, facing an audience, so your singer at the front, keyboards, bass, drums at the back, then put the amps near the back if you can. Then angle the amps towards the kind of the band a little bit and if you can angle them upwards so what you then get is the cone is hitting everybody and is hitting their ears if at all possible now obviously in a real live situation those speakers will be facing the audience but at least if you're practicing and you can hear everything you kind of know what to expect when that happens and if you're lucky you'll have um, stage monitors you might not be or it will be an e-kit which happens a lot at pubs, where it means you can actually bring the volume down anyway. Anyway, so speakers, tilt them so that the sound is heading towards your head, stand away from them so the sound has a chance to hit your head, angle them towards the right people. If there are PA speakers at the back, if you've got two of them, angle one of them towards the drummer so he can hear what's in it, and angle the other one towards everyone else so they can hear what's happening. Otherwise, what you get is you keep turning the uh, microphones up, and it gets louder and louder and louder and you perceive that you can't hear anything but actually it's deafening to anybody who stood a few feet in front of it so speaker position is really really essential six this one's especially for the guitarists turn your gain down and turn your mids up now in the bedroom especially to play heavy music there's a tendency to turn the gain all the way to a 10 and the middle all the way to zero you know, that deep chugging sound. Now it can work, but what tends to happen is as you turn the volume of the amps up, the perceived volume drops the more gain you get. So very often you'll find that a clean note with no distortion on it sounds much louder at the same volume than distorted. So roll the gain down and you'll find that actually it still sounds very heavy if that's what you're going for, that sounds louder in the room and people can hear it. If you then turn the mids up, it cuts through the rest of the mix. So you think about the sound spectrum, the bass player is handling the bass end of things. 
drummer and singer are handling kind of trebs and treble and a bit of upper mids and keyboard kind of sits across a lot of it depending on what you're playing the guitar is sitting in those low and upper mids that's your space so turning the mids down means you just cut your bit of the sound out of the mix and you've got loads of bass which doesn't take over from the bass player the drums and the cymbals take all the treble away from you so you're left with nothing so turn those mids up and you'll start hearing a much larger perceived volume change and if you want to really cut through get an eq pedal set it to an inverted v with the mids being boosted a bit of a volume boost and when you want your solo to really shine through rather than having to turn everything really loud boost the mids and you'll find you'll cut through the center of the mix really nicely so yeah that's probably the weirdest one that you only discover when you start playing. You, you realize that you sound like you've got loads more distortion and as you roll the distortion back, you can hear more of the guitar sound. It's really odd, but it's, it's a really useful tip um, and one that I didn't want to believe until I tried it. Number seven, use the volume control on a guitar or a mute switch in between songs because when you're you played, you do your thing, you stop. Especially when you're very loud, your guitar starts to amplify weird things, especially Telecasters. Oh dear. You'll hear the squeak of the strap against the back of the guitar. You'll hear you tapping on it, you'll move and it'll make a sound. So just turn the volume off. It goes for all of the musicians if they've got, um, going through an amp with a stringed instrument. Keyboards, not so much, but bass and guitar. Turn the volume off, hit the mute switch, whatever, so that you haven't got all the hissing and the buzzing and everything that comes with a loud amp and a piece of wood with strings on it. Number eight. Eight. Don't noodle so much. Now it's very tempting to just sit and play and whittle and noodle between songs, but actually what happens is it's distracting to other band members because usually when you're stopping you're talking to other people and you want to kind of maybe go over something. And if the keyboard player and the bass player are trying to nail something and you're sat there just whittling away and the drummer's kind of bang, it just means you can't do anything. So just stop. If you're the person who wants everyone to stop, just say stop. I'm trying to figure something out. Don't be cross, don't be silly. Just go, look, guys, give me a minute. I just got to sort this out. Um, and it also wastes time. The number of times you'll be, you'll, um, we've had it a few times, usually me, where everyone's waiting for you because they want to start the song and you're kind of just going do you like that oh you want to start Ooh, sorry okay yeah you know and it's it, it does just waste time and again if you're paying for the space don't waste time make use of it and everyone will be much more chilled out number nine record the session not for vanity although vanity is fine but so that you can analyze it so record it analyze it, criticize it, be honest and be constructive with feedback to the rest of the band. Because you'll often find interesting things that happen between songs that maybe are slowing you down. Or even during songs where maybe the guitarist, and I've done this myself, is so busy looking for what pedal he's about to hit next whilst trying to sing and do everything else, just misses the chords. So it's really important to look at that and be honest and give each other feedback, an honest appraisal polite and honest appraisal and be willing to listen back to it because you know it is frustrating for everyone else if you're constantly missing the same bit of a song because you're looking at the floor for the next button to press because you wanted a phaser instead of a flanger or whatever it might be and often what needs to happen is you need to strip everything back so that you're worrying less about effects and more about how the band sounds um, you also start to see the chemistry as well and how things work because when you first start, what you often find is you are just four people playing the same song. What you need to happen is you need to be one band playing one song, uh, which leads us to tip number 10, which is go for a drink afterwards. All right? It's very exciting being in the studio and there's a lot of adrenaline and it's a laugh and you're with your friends and you need to come down off that afterwards. So if you get the opportunity, go out for a drink or whatever, coffee shop, whatever it might be, whatever your poison is, within reason, and discuss the session. How do you think it went? What was good? What was bad? Congratulate each other, praise each other for what you've done. Constructively ask questions about 
could you have done something better? Did we need to have the flange of the phase of the chorus, the delay and the reverb on all at the same time on six different buttons? Or could it just been distortion or even just how about you just go straight into the amp? Whatever it might be, because to get that cohesive band going, you need to gel and you gel as people, not as musicians. So you need to go out, you need to talk to each other. Can't emphasize how important it is to have that kind of personal connection because otherwise, like I said, you're just four people playing the same song. You need to have a laugh, you need to enjoy it because if the audience doesn't see that you're getting on, it's really obvious and it looks sterile and fake. So, and you've seen, you've all seen bands like that where they don't even make eye contact with each other. So, at the end of a session, if you get the opportunity, go out. And as a 10A, especially in a band like us, where it's a few dads, guys who work, wrong side of 40, um, you don't necessarily have time to practice every week with people, with your, your bandmates. So we're getting in the studio once or twice a month at best. So create a WhatsApp group so that in between sessions, you can still be chatting, sending, sending each other stuff to do with the band, you know, clips of songs you might want to play. You know, there's nothing wrong with going to a session with a new song that you want to try, as long as everyone's aware that you're going to do it. Maybe you send them a clip of you playing it and everyone goes, oh, that sounds great. Or no, that's going to be rubbish, don't try it. Um, or, you know, maybe if there is somebody asking, well, what's the chords for this? And you can do a little video showing them the chord progressions, whatever it might be. And you can send each other jokes or whatever, you know, friendly things. Again, going back to this, you've got to be friends for the band to work nicely, especially when you're just playing pubs and clubs and stuff. You know, it's not about money. It's about playing the music and enjoying it. So, yeah, 10A WhatsApp group so that in between sessions, you can still be connected and chatting to each other. So that's my top 10 and a bit. When I do my first live gig type thing in September, I might do another one of these to tell you how wrong or right I might have been about my perceived needs for live playing. Um, let me know in the comments if I've missed anything or if you think I'm totally off the mark on anything. Subscribe and like because that makes me happy and I, I need you. No, 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 I'm, I, I need you. You, just you. Everyone else is okay, but just you, yep. Yeah? <laughs> Until next time, I'll see you soon. Cheers. Oh,